You're listening to an Axe Church sermon. If you haven't heard of Axe Church before, we are a church in Camas, Washington. You can check us out at axecamas.org. You can see what we're about and what we're up to. We're glad you're listening today and hope you enjoy this sermon. I don't have a lot of time to get into an intro today because we've got a lot to cover. We've been going through the book of Acts for a while now, um, and we're nearing the end of the book. Okay, and we're going to try to get through a lot of scripture today. Um, the better part of two chapters, um, even though some weeks we only get through maybe a verse or a couple of verses, we're really going to try to bite off a chunk today because I think it's important to do that um, because last week I went backwards. I promised you we'd do more this week, and I'm hoping to get the rest of this book done in just a few sermons. And so we're going to get to work today. Um, we have been with Paul and Luke and their companions on Paul's third missionary journey. Most recently we saw Paul in Greece um, we saw that in Troas, we saw the passage where Paul is preaching, and a guy named Eutychus falls out of a window and dies because he fell asleep while Paul is preaching. Let that be a lesson to you. Um, the Lord raised him from the dead. I do not promise that for you if you fall asleep. So... Um, but he raised them up, and then we had Paul um, in a place called Miletus, and he called the Ephesian elders to meet with him um, and, and kind of said farewell to them. And this is one of the things that he said to them as he was meeting with the elders. This is from Acts chapter 20, verses 22 through 24. It says, And see now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So we know this. We know that Paul has been called by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem, okay? We also know that he's determined to do that, even though he's being told over and over again that chains and tribulation, trouble, await him in Jerusalem. He's being told this, yet we know he's determined to do this. And so we already know that Paul's had a number of encounters with difficulty, right? With trouble, with pain. Um, and so it looks like he's in store, if these prophecies are to be true, which they are, uh, for some more trouble. And so we're going we're gonna to read about that. And nevertheless, even though he knows this is going to happen, here we have Paul at the beginning of chapter 21 with his companions headed toward Jerusalem and the trouble that may await. Let's read the first few verses here in chapter 21. So it says, Now it came to pass that when we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to cause the following day to Rhodes and from there to Patera. And finding this ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. We had sighted Cyprus. When we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria, and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload her cargo. All right, we have a map here so you can take a look at kind of where we are and where we've been going. Some of you like the map, some of you don't. Um, it doesn't matter. I'm going to show it to you anyway. So right about the middle of the map, you can see Miletus, where Paul met with the Ephesian elders. And then you can see that from there... He's headed uh, down and across uh, through Kos and Patera and so on, and they pass that island that you see on the left of them is Cyprus, and they head over to Tyre. That's where they end up at. Now, I always find it interesting how excessively detailed Luke is in his descriptions of their travels and so on. He's naming every single place that they went, and we have to ask ourselves, Why? Why does he do that? And we've talked about this before. This account is excessively detailed because it's historical. It's historical. That's why it's specific. One of the things that's important is to remember that these facts, remember Acts is about facts, that these facts are included so that we never kind of float into this place where we think of what's happening here as some sort of legend, as some sort of religious story that's not really real. Luke constantly is including all this detail, and we, as a result of that, can't be brought into this idea that we're reading about King Arthur or some other legendary character, okay, that these apostles or that Jesus, that these are just stories. These are, in fact, very specific accounts. Luke is considered to be a very um, adept historian, even by people to this day. Okay, and so he's including all this stuff. And of course, in this situation, Luke's with them. So he's using the word we. And so he certainly would have known what happened. And he wrote all these things down because that's what happened. And he wants us to know it, not because it's necessarily super important spiritually which direction they took to get to Tyre, but because it's important that we know that the facts are facts. And that you can go check those out and see that is actually the path you would have taken to do that and so on. So there we have that. Let's look at the next verse, verse 4. 
It says, and finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. And so they get to Tyre and they find disciples. Where did these disciples come from? Well, you may remember that back uh, some decades ago at this point, uh, Stephen, which is one of the deacons, was martyred. Okay? And what we had is a lot of persecution that came on the church. And the, and the church, the believers from Jerusalem, started spreading out all over the place. Okay? From Jerusalem to Samaria to Judea to all these places, which is exactly what Jesus had told them they were to do. That the Holy Spirit was going to come upon them in power. That they were going to be witnesses of him you know, in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And so that's what had happened. They'd spread out. And so in Tyre, in this area, apparently there was a church there. There were brothers there. So when they landed there, they were able to connect with these believers, with these Christians, and Paul was there. Now it says, they told him in the spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. But we know that Paul was called to go to Jerusalem. Uh, Is this a contradiction? No, the Spirit was not contradicting. This, I think, is just one of the uh, instances which we see many of where when they realize what's going to happen, where the, where the Holy Spirit tells them, this is what's going to happen to Paul, people are saying, don't go do that. That's bad. We don't want you to get hurt. We don't want you to be in chains. We don't want you to go through uh, tribulation. So once again, we have people saying, Paul, don't, don't go up there. It's going to be bad for you. Okay? Um, but Paul, who continues to hear this from everybody, does not stop his his uh, determination to go to Jerusalem. And so let's look in verses 5 through 8. It says, When we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way, and they all accompanied us with wives and children. And once again, the church is these families together. um, Till we were out of the city, and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. When we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship, and they returned home. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemaeus greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. All right. Now, for those of you who have been patient, we got to meet Philip again. Some of you may remember that Philip was a deacon, one of the original seven deacons, that he had gone to Samaria and brought the gospel there and was preaching there, and a lot of people in Samaria got saved. And then he was the same guy who met the Ethiopian eunuch who the Lord brought to himself through the ministry of Philip there in the chariot, maybe he ran up beside it. Um, and then we read this in chapter 8 of Acts. It said, But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea, which is where we are now, which is where we find Philip the deacon again. All these years later, here he is in Caesarea. And I told you, Lord willing, that we would see him again. And here we are. We see him again. I know this was a couple years and about three buildings ago that we saw Philip last time. But here's the thing. Do you see the benefit of sticking with Acts Church and being consistent here? You got to see Philip again. Wasn't it all worth it? Right? Worth every bit. Um, And here we are. We run into Philip again. We see, again, the connection. We sort of bookend. Here's Philip. We saw his ministry earlier. We know he was in Caesarea. We actually catch up with him all these years later. Um, And so we know one thing. Luke met Philip, right? So those earlier stories, maybe Luke was able to get some eyewitness testimony from Philip about what happened there that added to what the Holy Spirit did with Luke in writing this book. So here we go. Verses 9 through 11, it says, Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. All right. A couple of things here. First of all, we see that Philip's got these four daughters, that they're, that they're prophets, that they prophesy, they have the gift of prophecy. And once again, we see, as we see over and over and over again, that these first century Christ followers have this incredible value for women and their giftings and their place in the church. And of course, these four daughters would have been very important to the church and the folks there in Caesarea, which as we've talked about before, this is not the normal way that first century people talked about women. They did not hold them in high esteem, but the church always does. And so mentions these daughters, mentions their gifting. No doubt these, these daughters were an important part of what was going on in the church there. And then we meet Agabus again. We've met Agabus also before. Back in chapter 11, we studied about Agabus. He had made a prophecy about this uh, famine that was going to happen. And that famine in, ended up happening in the time of Claudius Caesar. And so we know that Agabus not only is a prophet, but he's a prophet that knows what he's doing. 
okay, that he really is hearing from the Lord. And he comes in, takes Paul's belt um, and binds himself up with it and tells him, this is what's going to happen to you. The person who owns this belt, is gonna, this is what's going to happen to them when they go to Jerusalem. You're going to get bound up. Um, the Jews are going to come after you and you're going to get turned over to the Gentiles. Pretty dramatic prophecy or way of prophesying to actually take this guy's belt off and go through uh, that to tell Paul about the trouble that he's going to go through in Jerusalem. I see as these people are telling him, we already know lots of people have told him what's going to happen, and this is kind of the culmination, the most dramatic one, um, Agabus coming and confirming, hey, bad stuff is going to go down for you. So let's see how Paul's friends react to this, verses 12 through 14. Now, when we heard these things, Both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? You're breaking my heart, right? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying the will of the Lord be done. Now, um, This is sort of the last stand of Paul's friends. This is not the first time that people have said to Paul, don't go. Don't go. Bad things uh, await you. And here they are pleading with him not to go. But if you remember from chapter 20, he said, and see now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem. Okay? Bound in the spirit. I got to go. The Spirit's told me to, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. This was before. Paul's known about this. He already knows that trouble is going to happen in Jerusalem. He's been, his, his face has been set towards it. He's been planning to go the whole time. Okay? He was not going to turn back. It was the Spirit who was compelling him to go. The Spirit was saying, you've got to go do this. And these folks that were traveling with him knew this. They knew that Paul felt compelled to go. And yet, here they are, breaking his heart. And of course, Paul loves his friends, right? And so when they're crying and pleading with him, which is, I assume, what's going on here, Paul, please don't go. Don't go. I'm sure it really was breaking his heart. You know, Paul would have had a very tender heart towards his friends. We can tell by how many people he mentions in the Scripture how close his friendships are. We can tell by the fact that what we just read about these families coming with him, who, assumedly, he just met in Tyre, right? And, and yet the children, the wives, the husbands, are all coming with him to pray with him as he leaves. This guy leaves a mark on people because he's so loving. And so as he loves these friends of his, and they're sitting here pleading with him, he's saying, stop it. Stop. You're breaking my heart. i got to go do this. I've got to go do this, and I'm not going to stay away from it because of fear. I'm willing to do what I need to do to preach the gospel, okay? He has to go. And instead of supporting him in this, which they know he has to do, they're trying to persuade him to stop. Now, um, this is kind of frustrating if you've ever been in this situation. We love our friends and our families, right? But sometimes they can let their concern for us cause them to try to persuade us to do things that seem right and wise to them, but are not the things that the Lord has called us to do, okay? When my wife and I uh, left, we lived here, um, and I was practicing law here, and we were called to go to Tennessee. Our families were not particularly excited or happy about us leaving, okay? Uh, Basically, they didn't want to lose Tiffany, and they didn't want to lose their grandkids. I don't think they probably care too much about me leaving, um, but, but they didn't want to lose those people, and I don't blame them. Their first reaction was not, yay, you're going to go 2,500 miles away and take my grandkids, okay? That was not the way that they felt about it, but once they realized that this was a call from the Lord and that we were determined to do what the Lord had called us to do, they supported us, as Paul's friends do here eventually, right? Um, here's what I would say. There's our wisdom, Okay? And, and if we're in Scripture and we're in the Spirit and we're whatever, we're going to grow and grow and grow in wisdom. And we're going to have wisdom. Okay, so there's our wisdom, and it can be very good. But then there are God's plans. And the two things, your wisdom and God's plans, are not always going to be the same. They're not always going to be the same. And so there are times when the Lord is going to ask us to do things that don't seem to make sense in our own wisdom. They don't necessarily seem wise at the time, but if the Lord calls us to go, calls us to do those things, we must go. So for my family and Tiffany's family, when we had to go to Tennessee, you know, they had to come around to that. Now, they got us back some years later, 
So it's kind of like, be careful what you hope for, because now they have to deal with me. Um, I'm back in, in this area, and so, uh, but they did. You know, they, they just had to be patient for a little while. Um, but, you know, when we were in Tennessee, we felt called to come here and plant a church in Camas and, and come and minister here. And, and be part of this that we're all doing here, that you've all been called to also, that we've all been called to together. Uh, the people in Tennessee weren't particularly happy about that. Again, they didn't want to lose Tiffany and my kids, um, which again makes sense. I don't know if they cared about me leaving, but they weren't particularly happy about that. But the same sort of thing happened, okay? They eventually supported us when they realized it was of the Lord that we were called to do this thing. And so when you have believers who are close to you, brothers and sisters in Christ that are close to you, who are called to do something from the Lord, be careful, be careful about trying to convince them not to do it, even if it doesn't seem wise to you, okay? The thing that they're about to do may be difficult. You may see that there's difficulties in that path, um, and especially if we have those of us who are close to us who are called to move away, right? Called to move somewhere far away, and we don't want them to go away, or called to do something dangerous, maybe to go to another country, whatever. We see, we see the danger. We see the difficulty, and there's wisdom in that. We see that it's going to be difficult, but if God has called them, He's called our brothers or our sisters to go do something. Our job is to support them, okay? Not to sit there and tell them how bad it's going to be. Not to sit there and say, this is going to be so bad for you, this is going to be so bad for you. When when God calls us to step out in faith, it generally is going to require a large amount of trust in him. And that's already hard to do. And usually if a brother or sister is called to do something, they're not unaware of the difficulties that might be involved in that. Be careful that you're not adding to the difficulty because you're walking in your wisdom, which isn't necessarily bad wisdom, but it's not what the Lord has called someone to do. See, if Paul had been convinced not to go to Jerusalem, we would have a very different next few chapters that we're going to read. And I think it was important to the Lord that things went the way that they they went here, okay? He may have avoided some temporary pain, maybe, but we wouldn't have the next part of this, this thing where, that ends up getting Paul all the way to Rome, which is sort of the center of the world at that time and his influence that he had there. And so um, having said all of that about being careful, I do want to mention a few things. There is nothing wrong with helping a person to discover whether or not the call that they're saying they have is really of the Lord, okay? So when someone says, I feel called to the Lord to go do this thing, and you have this thing that's like, that doesn't seem wise, it is okay to say, can we talk about or walk through what that call looks like? You know, so we can walk through that in community, okay, so that we can sense whether it's a call from the Lord, maybe maybe it's not, or maybe it's not now, whatever. So here are a couple things to look for if a brother or sister in Christ is saying they have a call to go do something. This is, this is just some practical stuff for you. The first question I would ask is, is it biblical? Is the thing they've been called to do consistent with Scripture? Is it biblical? Okay, maybe it involves difficulty, but if it's consistent with Scripture, then it, it may be okay. Um, so that's why, for instance, my call to be a lawyer was very questionable, right? Um, I'm not sure that it's biblical to be a lawyer, but that's a, come on, that's funny, guys. That's, that's all I've got for you today. Um, all right, I'll try harder. We got a lot more here, so I'll, I'll do better. Um, for instance, somebody says, I feel called to leave my spouse because we fell out of love, and it's just coincidentally, I met this person online, and they're really my soulmate, and God would want me to be happy, right? God would call me to be happy. Um, no. <laughs> eh, wrong answer. Not biblical, not consistent with Scripture. You should talk your brother or sister in Christ out of that, okay? Because that's not biblical. That's not consistent with Scripture. So if that's their call, they're wrong about that. Okay, so go ahead and persuade them not to do that. Persuade them hard not to do that. Um, But a call to the mission field or a call to move to another place to work where the Lord has called them, it very well may be biblically consistent. Okay, and so so that's the first thing I would look at. Next, I would ask yourself this. Is the person that you're dealing with shown consistently that they're hearing from the Lord and that they're walking with the Lord? Okay, are they hearing from the Lord consistently? Are they following the Lord consistently? Is that what you've seen as a pattern in your life? Of course, in Paul's case, we have that. Paul is regularly, consistently living in the Spirit, hearing from the Spirit, and and operating in his ministry on what the Spirit has called him to do. So there's really no question about whether Paul is consistently hearing from the Spirit. But if your brother or sister in Christ says they're called to do something, which seems unwise, it's fair for you to look at their lifestyle and what's going on to see if, in fact, they've shown a propensity to hear from the Lord. The next thing I would look at is, is there an, a, a, a strange amount of rush on the thing that they say they feel called to do? And is there a lack of seeking godly counsel? 
So if the person is, has not sought out the counsel of other mature believers or they're determined to do this thing like immediately right now, those are red flags. Those are red flags. And so, um, did, you know, did they ask you to pray through the process with them to help them confirm this call from the Lord? When I feel called to come here, um, you know, Tiffany and I dedicated 30 days to confirm the call. I felt called, but we wanted to make sure it wasn't bad sausage, right? Um, because, you know, things can happen. So we set aside time to confirm the call. I think it ended up being more than 30 days by the time that the Lord actually confirmed the call for us. But it took that time, right? At the same time, we were in relationship with other believers, real serious relationship. We had other godly counselors around us. We were in a good home group, and, and we had followed the Lord in the past. We got there in the first place by following the Lord, right? Uh, I ended up in law school by following the Lord. We, we'd follow the Lord in the past, not always perfectly, which is actually part of the learning process of knowing how to follow the Lord. And so there was evidence that when the Lord called us to do something, it was what we were called to do. But if you don't see that in the person's life, it's worth pausing. It's worth walking through with them, with your brother or sister, and trying to confirm whether or not the call that they're saying they have is a real call, okay? Um, there, there's an instance of this that's kind of classic uh, in, say, Christian colleges or Christian uh, uh, singles groups or young people groups where a guy will come to a girl and say, hey, uh, I just really feel called by the Lord that you and I are supposed to be married. Um, that's just the call I feel from the Lord, right? Uh, and, and so it's sort of a classic thing. And, and for instance, you know, that's what I did uh, with Tiffany. Um, so it works, guys. No, I'm totally kidding. She said it to me. <clears throat> anyway, um, no. No, that didn't happen. Here's the thing, ladies. If a guy comes up to you and says that to you, I just feel that the Lord has called me to marry you and us to be together, just say back to this guy, hey, listen, that is nice that you feel called to marry me, and as soon as the Lord calls me to marry you, I'll let you know. <laughs> don't hold your breath, okay? Um, that's just a weak pickup line, okay? Um, don't use the Lord in that way. But in this case, right, Paul has to, because they're, they're breaking his heart, he has to reaffirm his commitment to follow through on what the Lord has called him to do, to go to Jerusalem. And his brothers and sisters in Christ were not necessarily being helpful. He's kind of on his own at some level to, to maintain his resolve, but he does do that. They don't persuade him. And once, and once they realize he's not going to be persuaded, they get over it, and they, and they get behind him. Okay? They get behind him, um, and they give it over to the will of the Lord. Let the Lord's will be done, and they support him. Let's look at the next couple of verses, 15 and 16. And after those days, we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Also, some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain nation of Cyprus, an early disciple, with whom we were to lodge. I do not know how to say that name. I actually looked it up online. There were, multi, there were different things about how to say it. I don't know. Um, but Manasin is what I'm going to say. Um, they, this guy, uh, he was, it says he's an early disciple. And so that could mean a few things. It could mean that he was actually one of the disciples that was, that was going around with Jesus, like one of the original 120 that was there on Pentecost. It could also mean that he was one of the uh, Christ followers who came to the Lord, who came to follow the Lord and know and believe in him really, really early on after Pentecost when the church started. It could even mean that he was one of the guys who came to the Lord early on, like when Paul and Barnabas were starting their missionary journeys. If it's the first one and he was there from the very beginning, this would have been a good source for Luke, right? As the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to also write the gospel of Luke, uh, this guy may have been able to tell him um, eyewitness accounts about Christ's ministry on earth. Um, and so uh, let's look at the next few verses here, 17 through 20. And when we had come to Jerusalem, so they made it, the brethren received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. When he had greeted them, he told them in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. They get there, and the brethren, the believers, the elders, they greet them warmly, which would have been, which would have been awesome for them, right? They've been out on these missionary journeys, out on the mission field. They come back to Jerusalem, and the brothers greet them warmly. James is there. He appears to be leading the church. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus. Okay? This is the guy who did not believe in Jesus, did not believe that he was God, until Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to him. 
okay? Which is the only way I would ever believe my brother was God, too. Um, but that's, that's who this James is, and he's apparently sort of the leader of the church at Jerusalem at this time. Um, Paul tells the elders about what happened, what's gone on in their missionary journeys, and all these Gentiles and all these people who have come to the Lord, and when they heard it, they glorified God. They're excited, as we should be, okay? This is prescriptive. When you hear that people have gone from spiritual death to life and have followed Jesus, gotten baptized, and so on, you should be super jacked up. When we hear about what's going on with, with Steve Bragg and, and Pastor Alejo Lagos in the Philippines and people coming to know the Lord and people, and people being drawn to him and being saved and being baptized, and we hear about what's going on in Honduras and we have uh, new believers and new baptisms and so on, you should be jacked up, excited. Also, when we have people here who come to the Lord, when we have these baptisms and so on, the feeling that you should have should be one of incredible excitement and joy. Because you should love the Lord so much that you love these people so much, whether you know them or not, and are just so excited to see them have what you have if you're a follower of Christ, which is forgiveness of sins and life and transformation in him. They were excited. They were excited as they should be. And Paul had seen so many people follow Christ that this was just wonderful, awesome, joyful news to the elders who were overseeing the church in Jerusalem. All right, then James mentions these many myriads of Jewish people who had come to believe in Christ. Now, remember, Paul was trying to make it back to Jerusalem by Pentecost. Now, this Pentecost was actually decades after the Pentecost where the church started. But here we are at Pentecost, and if you'll remember, when the feasts are there, people are coming from all over the world for the feast. All over the world, they're coming in there. And so when James says, look, there's all these myriads of believers here, he's referring to all these people, believers from all over, who, who love the Lord Jesus and have come to Jerusalem. And the word myriad can just mean a lot of people without necessarily a number attached to it. But in the Greek, in this instance, it can also mean 10,000. A myriad would be 10,000. How many myriads would be how many 10,000s? So it's possible that James is referring to tens of thousands of believers that would have been in Jerusalem at this time. But he mentions something else. He mentions that these Jewish Christians are zealous for the law. Now, this is a problem because we've seen the difficulties the church has gone through, right? With the Jewish believers coming to Christ but not being able to give up um, the importance or the, or the level of importance that they put on the old ceremonial laws. You remember maybe Peter, when, the, when he has this vision, the blanket comes down and the Lord says to him, kill and eat. And he says, I've never done anything like that. I would never do that. I would never eat unclean food. It's the Lord telling him to do it. And he's still like, I would never do it. So they hold this very, very, very tightly. And when they come to the Lord, they don't necessarily just give it up. And these believers, all these believers who are here, these Jewish believers, yes, they follow Christ, but they're still very zealous for the law, and this is an issue. There's many, many people who are holding the law in very, very high regard. Remember, many years before Paul had been there in Jerusalem, and the Jerusalem council had come up with what the Gentiles needed to do. And it did not include doing all the things in the law. We'll see what they asked them to do here in a second. Um, but they had already ruled on this. It was not the most important thing, and yet there were so many Jews who were still so zealous for the law. So let's see what happens, verse 21 through 25. It says, But they have been informed about you, Paul, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing, except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Here at the end, again, we see what the Council of Jerusalem, Jerusalem had decided concerning the Gentiles or the non-Jewish believers, right? Nothing offered to idols, uh, no blood, nothing strangled, and stay away from sexual immorality. But as to the Jewish people that became believers, there was still this very, very strong thing that was saying you should keep all the customs that we used to keep. Jesus plus all the customs that we used to keep. Uh, many of them are continuing to do this. Now, I don't think we have any evidence to believe that this accusation that had been made about Paul is true. We've seen what Paul's preaching to people. He's not telling the Jews, don't circumcise your children, don't follow the customs. 
That's not what he was saying. He wasn't going in and trying to upset the apple cart in that kind of a way. What he, what he has said is that those things are not necessary for salvation, right? That you do not have to get circumcised and follow the laws to be saved. All you need to be saved is that you confess and repent and believe on Jesus Christ, believe in his resurrection, that he has the power to forgive sins and transform your life. That's what you need. You don't need something more than that. You don't need these customs. But he wasn't saying get rid of them if that was something that they wanted to do and so on, as long as they weren't saying it was necessary for salvation. That's all he could really be accused of, and yet they're accusing him of basically going around saying, get rid of the law, get rid of the Jewish stuff, and so on, which would have been very offensive to them. Very offensive to them. Um, Okay, Uh, so uh, remember this, though, which I find interesting. Remember Paul had Timothy circumcised. Right? So if he was so against all this stuff, remember not that long ago, he took a vow like these guys who we just read about took a vow. It was a Jewish thing. It was a Nazarite vow. If you want to um, hear more about that, I talked about it a few sermons ago when we were in chapter 18. Uh, you can also read number six to find out about this Nazarite vow. And what they're asking him to do here is basically take these guys, um, these four guys who have taken a Nazarite vow, go with them because it's a very Jewish thing to do. Go with them and pay their expenses. If you read in number six about the Nazarite vow, there's certain offerings uh, and sacrifices that had to be made at the end of that vow. And he's saying, look, go pay for these guys so that everybody can see that you're, that you're behind this, that you're still following the customs because you're a Jewish guy and you're not telling people to get rid of it. You're not telling people to get rid of these customs. Now, if you remember last week, if you were here, we read a passage in 1 Corinthians where Paul was saying, look, I'm going to become all things to all men so that by all means... I might save some, right? That he's going to become relevant. He's going to become relevant to these folks. And that's, of course, what he's doing here by going through this process, listening to the wise counsel of these folks, and going through this process of fulfilling these Jewish traditions so that he can effectively be able to preach and win a hearing for the truth of the gospel. That's why he does it. He doesn't want something to be in the way. This is about being relevant. This, isn't about, uh, this is about not being purposely offensive, Okay, if I can wear jeans to preach here at Acts Church, but in order to go to another church, I got to wear a three-piece suit in order to preach, so I don't offend somebody. Then so be it, right? I look good in a three-piece suit, right? I don't care, right? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I don't care. The clothes are not the important thing. Jesus Christ is the important thing. The truth is the important thing. It, I would not want the clothes I was wearing to cause a distraction when I'm preaching the gospel. That's why I'm wearing a shirt today. I thought shorts and no shirt would be more comfortable. Tiffany said, it's going to be a distraction. I'm like, not for me. Um, Yeah, that's right. Pray for him. Um, I didn't want you all to see my tramp stamp. So uh, now you're wondering. You're wondering. We'll see, maybe later. Um, Seriously, though, Paul is living out here a commitment, right, to do the things not that are necessary. He doesn't have to go do all this stuff. They're not necessary for him to do in order to be a Christian or to be a good person or whatever, to be a Christ follower, but they're helpful for winning people to the Lord, for getting people, for getting an opportunity, for winning an opportunity to speak the truth. So that's why he does this. So let's see how it works out for him. Verses 26 through 30. It says, Then Paul took the men. And the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. Now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. It didn't work. Um, He went through this process, but it wasn't enough for them. So we have these Jewish people from Asia. Assumedly, these are people from Ephesus. Remember, if you have been around, Paul was in Ephesus for a long time, right? He he reached all of Asia, but the Jews there were not happy with Paul, as they usually weren't. Those that didn't come to Christ usually were. And these guys, so they know who Paul was. He's lived in their city for quite a while. They see Paul, and they accuse him of two things. One, of teaching all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place, that is the temple. 
and two, of bringing a Gentile into the inner courts of the temple. These are the accusations leveled against Paul. These are serious accusations. Now, if these guys were from Ephesus, they might have known Trophimus, this guy, and maybe they had seen Trophimus with Paul in the city and so assumed or at least tried to accuse Paul of bringing Trophimus into the temple. But neither of these accusations are true. We've already discussed that Paul was not teaching against the law in the way that they're suggesting that he was. He was simply teaching that the law was not the thing that led to salvation. Jesus Christ was. Okay, very different than saying it's bad and so on. In fact, he talks about how the law is important because we would never know our need for Jesus if we didn't know the law and that we were lawbreakers, right? So he's actually not against the law in this kind of way they're saying. But we also know, right, Paul would not have brought Trophimus into the temple. The whole thing he was trying to do was to be all things to all men. The last thing he would do was something purposely offensive when the whole thing was he has his heart to see Jewish people turn to the Lord Jesus. He would never have brought Trophimus into the inner courts of the temple. The penalty for bringing someone into the inner courts of the temple was death. There were actually signs up in the temple, and this is what they read. No foreigner is to enter within the forecourt and the balustrade around the sanctuary. Whoever is caught will have himself to blame for his subsequent death which is a really fancy way of saying if you cross this line, you're dead, right? This was the warning. It was serious, okay? Uh, so they, they, they yell these things out. Everybody grabs Paul. They, they take him. They seize him. They take him out. They shut the doors. Um, so the prophecies are coming true, right? All the things that were said are now coming true. He's got trouble coming. The whole city was disturbed by this uproar. If you've been around for a while, you know that when Paul goes around, he tends to shake things up. And why does he tend to shake things up? Because Jesus and the name of Jesus tends to shake things up. And that's what happened here. Shook things up. Let's look at what happens in the next few verses, 31 through 36. It says, now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken to the barracks. When they reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after crying out, away with him. They start to try to kill him. They get him out, and they're going to mob violence, just kill Paul right there. Not the first time Paul's been in this type of a situation. But the commander of the garrison hears about what's going on, and he has to get centurions and soldiers and run down there to stop this mob violence. And Paul ends up in chains, as was prophesied, right? Uh, And the people, once again, we see this thing where they get this mob together, and the people can't keep their story straight. One person's yelling this thing. One person's yelling something else. They don't really know why they're there. This is kind of the nature of mob violence is that people just sort of get together and they get frenzied and these things happen. So the commander takes Paul to the barracks. The people follow screaming out, away with him. And it's so violent that they actually have to carry Paul up the stairs. Let's look at what happens in the next couple verses here, 37 through 39. Then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I speak to you? He replied, can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? But Paul said, I'm a Jew from Tarsus and Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So Paul, as he seems to always do, asked to speak to this guy. Now the commander says to him, wait a second, um, why can you speak Greek? I thought you were this Egyptian guy who led these 4,000 people in this rebellion. Uh, You can read about this in the history. Josephus writes about this, which is uh, an ancient historian, writes about this Egyptian guy uh, who was a false prophet who came and led these people and basically tried to rebel against the Romans. Actually, Josephus gives a different number than 4,000. I think he says something like 30,000. But scholars actually go with Luke's number of 4,000 as probably more accurate, once again showing you that as as a historical work, Luke's book here is highly esteemed as history, okay? Even more so in this case than Josephus' account, which is also highly esteemed as history. So Paul mentions that he's a a citizen of the city of Tarsus and convinces the commander to what? To let him give a little sermon. Paul is always wanting to preach, right? In the most crazy of circumstances. 
I, I hope I would have had the courage to do that, but if I had just been almost killed by a mob and they're sitting there screaming and yelling away with him and so on, I'm like, can we get inside? I, I don't want to be out here with these people who all want to kill me. But Paul, he's just like, no, I got a chance. There's a whole crowd here. He doesn't care if that crowd is a crowd that wants to kill him or not. It's a crowd of people. He can preach. So that's what he's going to do. Um, and so let's, let's look at, we're going to read through a bunch of verses here, the end of this chapter and into the next chapter. It says this, so when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people, and when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language. Okay, now, why is he speaking in the Hebrew language? All things to all men. They've quieted down. Now he knows if he speaks in Hebrew, they're more likely to listen to him because what is he being accused of? Of being against Judaism. So he don't want to speak in Greek. He wants to speak in Hebrew, and so he speaks in the Hebrew language saying this, brethren and fathers, once again, He's showing respect. He's showing respect to these people, brethren and fathers. Hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. So now they're listening. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law and zealous toward God as you all are today. So here he is. He's, he's, he's laying out his CV. He's laying out uh, his resume as a Jew. Hey, I'm a Jew. I was born in Tarsus, but I was raised here. Gamaliel, who was a major Pharisee okay, teacher, well, well respected, saying, I was taught by Gamaliel. I'm legit. Okay? I'm here. I'm one of you. He's starting out with that. I persecuted this way. When some of the way, he's talking about the believers, the Christ followers, the Christians. I persecuted this way to the death binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness. Ask him. That's what I used to do, right? And all the council of the elders from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains, even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. He's saying, listen, I am a Jew. I'm zealous for the law. I'm so zealous for the law that I was a persecutor of believers. I was a persecutor of Christ followers. Not only here, but I actually got letters from the council to go up to Damascus and put them in chains and bring them back here so we could punish more of them. I was the one who was ready to wipe this, these people out because I was so passionate for the law. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who are with me, now why does he mention them? Go ask them. They will testify to what happened here. Those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light being led by the hand of those who are with me, I came into Damascus. So he's blinded by this light. He's headed to Damascus. You've heard this story before if you've been here for long. It's not the first time Paul talks about his conversion. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law. You see what he's doing here? Having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there. Setting this up. I'm like you. I'm with you. I respect you. I respect other Jews. He came to me, or dwelt there, came to me, and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour I looked up at him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and, I, and saw him saying to me, so this is Jesus talking to him, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. Now he's setting them up. He had come back to Jerusalem, and Jesus had told him, they're not going to listen to you. They're not going to listen to you. What's his argument to Jesus? So he's going to argue back. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I am imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, we've talked about this, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. So Paul is setting this up. Listen. I was here at that time, and I wanted to preach to you, and I thought for sure that you'd hear me because you knew who I was. You knew how passionate I was, so of course you'd want to hear this conversion story and how Jesus told me the truth about this, and Jesus was saying, no, don't. You've got to go away, which is, which is what's happened here. He's come back again, giving this same story and seeing that they don't seem to care. 
Then he said to me, this is Jesus talking to Paul again, depart for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Now that's an important word here. And they listened to him until this word. And then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth for he is not fit to live. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air. Remember this is a way of showing that you're just, you're absolutely disgusted. Throwing dust in the air, tearing your clothes, this would have been a way that they would have, in their culture, shown how disgusted they were with what Paul said as soon as he said, going to the Gentiles. Okay? Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust in the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so he might know why they so shouted against him. Once they heard the word Gentiles... They could not stand it anymore. They were not going to listen to him anymore. These people hated Gentiles. They hated them. They hated the Romans and the occupation of their land. They hated people who they thought they were better than. They thought they were better than the Gentiles. They were more important than Gentiles. These were God's chosen people. They couldn't stand the Gentiles. And they thought Paul was defiling their traditions by going to the Gentiles, by taking the good news to the Gentiles and then defiling their traditions in that way, and they were willing to kill him over it. They were willing to kill him. Now, Lord willing, as we continue to study, you're going to see just how far some of them were willing to go to try to kill Paul. But this is the same story we see over and over again in the book of Acts. The truth of Jesus Christ is preached. It's preached peacefully. It's preached powerfully. And some people find life in it, and some people find death in it. Those that find death in it are willing to do anything to get rid of the Christian witness and to eradicate it. Anything. And so that's what we see here. But here's the thing. They cannot get rid of it. They cannot stop it. They could not then, and they cannot now, no matter how much they don't like it, no matter how much they hate it. There are still people in some places who commit violence and murder against Christ followers because they're Christ followers. That still happens to this day. Okay? Paul said it himself. He, he knew that death was a possibility, remember? Then Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul knew the hearts of some people were set against Jesus. This wasn't the first time he's seen this. He was ready to pay the price that it might cost because he knew that he was called to preach and testify and witness to the truth and that the truth cannot and would not be stopped no matter what happened to him. And that's true now. The truth cannot and will not be stopped. And guess what? You're called to preach it. It's your job. It's your calling. We talked about this last week. Paul finished running his race a long time ago, but you're still running yours. You're still running yours. And in preaching the truth, preaching the gospel, you're unlikely to face anything like what Paul faced. Okay? You're unlikely to face much more than maybe some awkwardness. Look at what he had to face. Look at what you have to face. Not much. Paul was almost killed by a mob. Now, we used to do this thing at George Fox University where I was a student. Um, and it goes back at least as far as when my dad was a student. So that's a long time ago because I'm old, so he's really old. And it was called the Bruin Brawl. The Bruin Brawl. I don't know if any of you went to George Fox or any of you took part in this. But basically, uh, at any time, someone could do something called Flash the Bruin. It doesn't, it's not as bad as it sounds. Um, which was the school mascot. Okay, It's this bear. And basically, uh, it's a little leather teddy bear, about this size. Um, and it could happen at any time. And what would happen is basically they'd throw it out, and it, it, they, they, whoever could get it off campus, freshmen, sophomore, junior, seniors, kind of, or a team, and whichever class could get it off of campus sort of won that Bruin brawl, and then they would be responsible the next time to throw it out. Now, uh, this thing was a brawl. A, I mean, it was crazy. I can't believe they let us do it. Um, even when I was in school, it was, I can imagine when my dad was in school because that was like the Stone Age, but even when I was in school, it was kind of crazy that they let us do it. I mean, bodies are flying everywhere, everywhere. Uh, everyone's fighting to get the stupid teddy bear. And it would end up in this pile of humanity kind of wrestling and scratching and clawing to get at this thing. Now, I mention this because in this situation, Jerusalem, Paul was the Bruin, right? Paul is, is there on the bottom of the pile getting pummeled. Um, and, and I can just, I cannot imagine how scary it would have been because I remember being in one of these room brawls and you get kind of into the pile and you sort of don't have control. And I'm a pretty big guy, 
right? But it was kind of scary because it was pretty violent and so on. Now, I can't imagine being in a situation where people wanted to kill me, right? And Paul didn't care. I'm not saying he didn't care like he wasn't scared. I'm not saying he didn't care like it didn't hurt. I'm saying he didn't care like what was going to be the most important was he was going to preach the gospel regardless. He was going to preach the gospel because of his love for Jesus Christ. It was not going to stop him no matter what. Now, I hope that the Lord builds me up like Paul, that I could face anything, that I could face anything that life brings to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope that for you too. I hope that Christ's church here in this building, anyone listening online, that Christ's church all over the world will rise up and start to have the kind of passion to proclaim the truth of the gospel that Paul had to be willing to do it no matter what. If just the people who listened to this message, just those people, had anything, anything like the passion for the truth that Paul did, there would be forgiveness of sins and change transforms, transformed lives from Camus to the ends of the earth. Just this group, just this group. Remember, they started with 120 in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now there's myriads of believers in Jerusalem. There's believers all over the world at this point. And now, of course, billions since then have come to know the Lord. Now, why do I keep talking about this? We talked about evangelism last week, and once again, I'm talking about it. Why do I keep talking about it? Well, because the scripture keeps talking about it, so it must be important, because I know that we're called to do it, and if scripture continues to tell these stories about Paul and showing us that he was willing to face fear, that he was willing to face death, that he was willing to face pain, to, to preach the gospel, and we know that you're called and I'm called to preach the gospel and that we are having a hard time in our culture right now facing even awkwardness, something's wrong. We have to step forward. We have to step up. We've got to step out. It's time for us to, to, to do a gut check. Time for us to do a gut check. Are we going to be like Paul? Are we going to be willing to face anything? Are we going to continue to shy away at the slightest inconvenience when we're called to preach the gospel? Once again, as I told you last week, be praying for the people who God's going to put in front of you. Be praying for that city of people that you're the watchman on the wall for. And do not shrink back from preaching the gospel. It's very unlikely this is going to happen to you. But you know what? Maybe it would. Paul had to deal with it. Why shouldn't you? Is the life that you found in Christ and the forgiveness of sins and the, sur the surety and the hope of eternal life and being with Jesus not important, not amazing? Should you be sharing that? Should you keep that to yourself? Paul didn't want to. He's trying to preach to the people who are trying to kill him. I can barely talk to somebody at the Starbucks. I'm just being honest. It's time to get real. Let's live like that, like Paul did. Let's love Jesus like that. Let's love other people like that. Let's see Christ change the world through us. Let's see it. Let's do it. Let's see him do it again. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for everything that you've done for us, for this church. Lord, I pray that you give us the strength and the courage to preach the gospel wherever you call us to preach it. Lord, I just pray that Thanks for listening to our sermon. Again, this has been a sermon from Axe Church in Camas, Washington. We hope you enjoyed it and got a lot out of it. If you did, you can subscribe to our channel as well as liking and commenting. We love to hear how these sermons are impacting you. You can also take a look at our podcast series that we have out. And we'll catch you again next week.